very pleased to uh, be here with my longtime friend and mentor and colleague, uh, uh, R.E. Longstaff, uh, senior district judge. I thought that we might start this discussion uh, by doing kind of a summary and uh, brilliantly written because I wrote it. Uh, it the, uh, the resolution that was presented to the uh, United States Courts for the Eighth Circuit uh, at the uh, conference uh, in Colorado. And uh, it was the resolution, of course, marking uh, your taking senior status. And uh, it provides as follows. On behalf of the judicial officers and the entire court family in the Southern District of Iowa, I write to recognize the enormous public service contribution of Judge Ronald E. Longstaff, who took senior status on November 5, 2006. Judge Longstaff has now essentially held every job in our courthouse not involving a broom or a gun, and he has performed with great distinction in every capacity. Judge Longstaff began his service to the people of the United States from 1965 to 1967 as a law clerk to the Honorable Roy L. Stevenson during Judge Stevenson's district court service. Judge Stevenson was so impressed with young Ron Longstaff's service that he strongly encouraged him to return as the United States Commissioner from 1968 to 1970 and the Clerk of Court from 1968 to 1976. He was president of the Federal Court uh, Clerks Association from 1974 to 1975. Judge Longstaff was named a United States Magistrate Judge in 1970, serving in that capacity until 1991. He would later serve on the Committee on Administration of the Magistrate Judge's System of the Judicial Conference for several years. On July 24, 1991, President George Herbert Walker Bush nominated Ronald Earl Longstaff to be a United States District Judge with bipartisan, indeed universal, support. Barely over three months later, he was confirmed by the United States Senate on Halloween. Judge Longstaff has met and exceeded all expectations that would be an excellent trial judge. His administrative skills served our court as chief judge from 1999 to 2006. Ronald Earl Longstaff entered the world at Pittsburgh, Kansas in 1941 and grew up with a strength of purpose that comes from having a few extra challenges in life and with a keen intellectual gift. He excelled at Pittsburgh State College, graduating in 1962 with a degree in accounting. In 2006, his alma mater honored Judge Longstaff for his lifetime achievement. Coming to Iowa to study law at the University of Iowa on a full tuition scholarship, Judge Longstaff continued to perform at an outstanding level. While there, he distinguished himself by having three articles published in the Iowa Law Review. With an apparent eye to his future, the articles involved the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution, prior restraint, and diversity jurisdiction. In future years, Judge Longstaff would often demonstrate his loyalty and support for the legal education at the University of Iowa, perhaps most notably in his efforts to create and sustain the Roy L. Stevenson Trial Advocacy Program, which has enhanced the skills of a host of young lawyers. Having obtained his JD degree from Iowa, becoming an Iowa Hawkeye athletics fan of uh, legendary proportions, and with the opportunity to work for Judge Stevenson, Judge Longstaff was happily an Iowan forevermore. It became even happier when he met his life partner, Norma, whose support of him has been support of us all. Judge Longstaff has served and continues to serve our district with legal precision, steadfast dedication, absolute integrity, personal compassion, and renowned good humor. He has been a treasured colleague to a dozen district and magistrate judges in our district. He has been a remarkable mentor to 22 law clerks who have gone on to share his contribution with the profession. And he has gained far-reaching respect among the members of the bar. All of these recipients of Judge Longstaff's contributions join in congratulating him on the occasion of his taking senior status and wish him the very best as he enjoys a little more time with his family, a few more Iowa games, and a little more golf, while at the same time making a continued contribution to the United States courts. Uh, having read that, Judge, I'm not sure that you could go to any more Iowa games, um, but uh, uh, that gives us kind of a, a general summary of who we're talking here uh, to today. Talk to me about 
growing up uh, on the prairie of Kansas, uh, uh, what was it like uh, in the early days for Ron Longstaff? Okay, well, as you said, I was born in 1941, uh, just prior to the start of World War II. So uh, my memories of the war are not that distinct, but uh, I do remember as a young boy, uh, my father was uh, a, a very avid gardener. And in those days, they had what they called victory gardens. Everyone was encouraged to plant their own garden and grow their own produce, etc. Dad, being a typical uh, enthusiastic supporter of his government, he had settled with one garden. We had five, so he, I used to uh, go around with him after work every uh, every evening in the mid forties and would tend to all those gardens. And that's a very early memory I have. Uh, of my childhood. My uh, father was rather a remarkable man. Uh, his, uh, they'd come from England in the early 1900s, and uh, my grandfather was a coal miner, so they'd settled in Pittsburgh, Kansas, where there was substantial coal deposits and there were deep mines uh, in operation at that time. So one of the unique things uh, about that is he went through the eighth grade, and at that time there was no further schooling in uh, southeast Kansas for him. So rather than start and take the eighth grade over, his father thought he should go to work. So they put him in work in the mines when he was 12 years old. And uh, he was uh, in the deep mines at that time. And one thing they found for Dad to do was that because he was small and he was quick, they'd have him down in the deep mines, and his job was to light the dynamite uh, because he could get back and go through the hole quicker. So, so they had this 12, 13-year-old kid doing an absolutely dangerous job. But obviously that was oh, probably about 1910, and he did that, uh, worked in the deep mines until he went into World War I, about 1918, and then came back and worked for an electric company in Kansas and made a good living and um, provided for us well. We had a very, very healthy uh, middle class upbringing. I had one brother who was 10 years older than I am, but, so essentially I became a only child and uh, was uh, extremely well treated by my parents. Went to a college, as you said, there in Pittsburgh, Kansas. I was uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely certain that I wanted to be an accountant and work for a large, large accounting firm. So I obtained a business degree with a uh, specialty in accounting. And my senior year, I got an internship in Kansas City working for a large accounting firm, CPA firm, that time called Hanskin and Sales. I did that for four months, and I came home to uh, one of my close uh, professors at uh, Pittsburgh State and told him, I absolutely hate this life. There's no way I could be an accountant for the rest of my life. What shall I do? And he said, well, you can always go to law school. So that's when I started thinking about going to law school in the spring of 1962. Uh, getting into law school in those days was a little bit easier than it is now. And my friend, his name was Professor Charles Riley taught business law at Pittsburgh and was a graduate of the University of Iowa. So uh, through his friendship and arrangements, he brought me up to Iowa City uh, probably in May of uh, 1965. And through arrangements by uh, June, I had a full tuition and scholarship. I'd been accepted to Iowa and I had a room and board job at the Quadrangle as an a advisor, a full advisor to the students. 
So I was all set up, and in September I came up and started law school at, uh, at Iowa. So I, I guess uh, you could say I was a Kansan by birth, but a Hawkeye by the grace of God. So <laughs> that's how I ended up at Iowa. Let me take you back to uh, your comments about uh, the family and coal mining. Uh, when you got into the 60s and 70s, uh, you would have spent a lot of judicial time considering black lung cases. Um, did your family history uh, play any role in your consideration of those cases? You know, it really did. Uh, we, we had, a, because of some of the mines in southern Iowa, we had a substantial number of black lung cases in the 70s and early 80s. and the judges would refer those to me as magistrate to do a report and recommendation on. And I'd done quite a number of them. And then, uh, of course, they were claiming they had black lung disease. And the, the key was they had to prove it. And of course, it was very difficult getting records back that far. Uh, and there was a, was a presumption that if you'd uh, Served, if you'd served in the coal mines for over 15 years and could prove it, establish it, there was a presumption that you had black lung disease and the standard to prove it lowered substantially. So I had this one case where uh, the, the man was insisting that he had spent 20 years in the mines, but he uh, only had records to show like he'd spent 13 and 14 and the government was contesting this presumption. And uh, he was at the hearing we were having, uh, or it was an administrative appeal, but we were having an oral argument on it. And uh, he had insisted at the uh, lower, uh, at the hearing in the administrative uh, court that he'd actually served early on as a young man, as a teenager, and that, that, that did not reflect on his records. And the government was saying, well, that if you were there, it would be on your records. And I finally said, no, that's not right. I know all about that because my dad worked in the coal mines for uh, eight or nine years as a teenager, and they wouldn't pay him directly, but they put his pay on his father's uh, paycheck, so it was through his father. So, so I believe the man is not going to give him the 15-year uh, presumption, and he got benefit. So, uh, at least that applicant was rewarded by my background experience in that regard. What else do you bring from growing up in Kansas that has been important to you throughout the years in all of your positions? Well, my, my family was, was a very conservative family. Uh, Mom and Dad, uh, um, they came from backgrounds. They were not, uh, they were not uh, married until later in life. And when I came along, they were both in their 40s and uh, were not uh, anticipating ever having a child. At the, that uh, time of their life, but they were extremely uh, patient and loving in raising me and uh, very patient. They, they, they actually found out when I was uh, in my early years, about seven or eight, I was diagnosed as having a slight uh, case of cerebral palsy. And they'd taken me to uh, a uh, hospital in Wichita for an examination and a recommendation. And they did have a uh, recommendation and had a letter that uh, the doctor sent them advising them that uh, their son Ronald would never be able to compete in the uh, public school system and they, the only fair thing to do would be to institutionalize him. and. Uh, try to uh, provide for them in that manner. My parents, being loving and supportive, uh, decided that that was unnecessary, and obviously they left me in the, the public school system. Uh, I grew up, uh, was able to participate in, at least in intramural sports, although I was never good enough to, to make the varsity team. 
but uh, maintained an active interest in sports and uh, ended up being president of the student council in uh, high school and uh, successful politician in, in uh, college too, although I raised more hell than I should. But I just, uh, you know, I, I, I've always been blessed by the thought that my parents uh, had faith in me and gave me the love and support to give me the background and the confidence to uh, go on with life and, uh, and then come to Iowa. You know, it, it, uh, I'm really disappointed that doctor isn't still alive. There's something I'd like to show him. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's why I, they call him opinions, I, I guess. I thought about that. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it just a, a, an example of how, how uh, the wrong decision at that early stage of my life could totally uh, uh, change the course of my life. and. Uh, you know, what, uh, for me, what a tragedy that would have been. You and I, of course, have talked about this over the past years, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's a remarkable example of what uh, what support and dedication and insistence upon trying uh, can mean, uh, and uh, and really terrific. And, and of course, uh, it was good that the family was able to see uh, much of what you've done uh, over the years in that regard. But unfortunately, by the time I. Uh, I, uh, President Bush appointed me as a United States District Court judge. Both my parents had passed away, but uh, anyway, they they did see me make substantial progress. Absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Well, all right, we we got you out of uh, Pittsburgh, and and we got you convinced that being an accountant is uh, uh, not the way you want to live the rest of your life. But there are probably all kinds of wonderful things that happened at Pittsburgh State, but that's for somebody else's <laughs> interview. So, so we'll talk to you about the Iowa College of Law. Um, when you got there, uh, was this uh, uh, the first time you've been away from home for a long time? Right, other than, you know, I attended some Sunday schools like at Kansas and went up and spent some at Wisconsin, but this was the first time I'd really left home, and uh, even in college I lived at home, so I never really uh, been out of that atmosphere until I came to to uh, Iowa in the fall of 62. And it, it was somewhat intimidating became, because I came to Iowa City literally without knowing anyone. And uh, my parents brought me up and I still remember them uh, driving out from the quadrangle uh, that evening as they were uh, going returned to Kansas. I walked into the dorm and was before everyone else had come because the advisors were there early and it was a very a vacant dorm and I truly wondered what my life held. Well, how fortunate for you that you were going to law school and you wouldn't have had any time for a social life anyway. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Although we made a few. Now, um, you were published three times. You right. argue. Right. Now, is that a record? Uh, it's a record. I think uh, it's been tied once. I think that there's been two students in the history of the Iowa Law Review that have had three articles published. And uh, what happens is, as a freshman, they have a writing competition, and everyone, as a freshman, has to uh, write a a uh, comment on a case, at least it was that way in 62. And then they all selected two or three of those to, for publication. I had the good fortune of having one published, and then I had another comment uh, article published as a uh, second-year law student, and then also published a note that year. And then my senior year, I was a uh, selected as an editor of the Law Review and served in that capacity during the third year. What really got your interest in law school? Uh, well, like I say, it was desperation for something I didn't want to do as a, as a coward. But uh, no, I, I think I had always uh, admired the law and lawyers and obviously seen the uh, scenes of uh, courtroom experiences and uh, 
uh, pictured what it would be like in that capacity. And I, I guess that uh, it just was a, uh, once I got there, I really became enthusiastic about pursuing uh, legal education and so sort of trusted in the uh, you know, future that there would be a spot for me somewhere along the lines. Are there professors or subject matter in law school that uh, really uh, stirred you more than others? We were really blessed in 62. When, when I think about back about the faculty we had at Iowa, it was really remarkable. Was Dean Mason Ladd was the longtime dean at Iowa, and he was a uh, national authority on evidence and had written several uh, textbooks on evidence. So he was a key factor in, uh, and, and he was still teaching at that time too. Then we had uh, uh, Vestal, Professor Alan Vestal was an authority in the area of uh, civil procedure. And uh, then we had Jeffrey O'Connell who later became renowned in the insurance industry and he taught torts. That became my favorite subject. Uh, at that time, it was a year-long course. and was just fascinating. Uh, Professor Boyd, Willard Boyd, who later became president of the university, was teaching contracts for my first year, and I developed a close relationship with him. Uh, Twenty years later, I guess around 1988, uh, hired his son, Tom, as my law clerk, and Tom served uh, me well for a year and then went on as Judge Lay's law clerk and has done fabulously well as a lawyer up in uh, Minneapolis. But uh, it was a remarkable faculty at that time and uh, they, they just made the law come alive and really was a a very unique, interesting experience. One thing they, they did at that time, I, because of my uh, my physical concerns and problems, I, my, my writing was not the best in the world. So they did allow me to type my uh, my exams, and they put me in a room in the just off the library and let me type the exams. So. Uh, that was a combination. I think a lot of students do that today, but in those days that was quite unusual, but they made that combination for me, and uh, I was always grateful for that. Although I may have been better off if they couldn't read my answers, I don't know. <laughs> Give you the benefit of right. that. All right, you, um, you get to the end of that experience and um, you're deciding what to do uh, after law school. Uh, you ended up with the federal court in 1965, but uh, was that an initial plan or how did that develop? Well, I'd interviewed some, some law firms, uh, uh, both in Des Moines and, and Davenport, and uh, actually did not receive any offers. And uh, about that time, in, in those days, uh, Dean Ladd, selected the law clerks for the federal judges. The federal judges didn't even accept applications for their clerkships. Uh, it was Judge Stevenson, Judge Hanson, and Judge McManus, and each year they would take a, uh, a clerk, uh, clerk from the University of Iowa and they just took whoever Dean Land sent them. And uh, so things were a little bit different. Well, Dean Land called me into his office one day and suggested that uh, I go clerk for a wonderful judge named Judge William Hanson in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and told me that was God's country and I would just fit in well up in Fort Dodge. So I, I said, that's fine. So I accepted the job because I never met Judge, judge Hanson. This was about November of 64. And then about April of 65, uh, the dean called me into his office and told me he had some bad news for me that uh, Judge Hanson had decided to retain his clerk for another year and there was not a position available and I no longer had a job. 
But one of my best friends, in fact, his name was Norm Wolf from Lots Nature in Iowa, uh, had been selected to be Judge Stevenson's law clerk. And at that time, of course, the Vietnam War was uh, really begin, be, uh, beginning to uh, uh, engage a lot of young men and women uh, with the draft. and. Uh, it was a real concern for those who were eligible for the draft, and Norm was one of them. And Norm had been advised that his uh, number was coming up for the draft. So Norm and I retired one night to the uh, local pub known as the Annettes, we uh, lost a spell of time at. And by the end of the evening, I had convinced Norm that his best option would be to join Jag or he'd end up carrying a gun in Vietnam. So uh, Norm pursued that. And uh, later that week, he went and told Dean Ladd that he uh, was going to do that, and so he would not be accepting the law clerkship for Judge uh, Stevenson. So it just so happened that when, the, when Norm left the dean's office, I just happened to be standing there. And as he answered, uh, uh, and Norm had been uh, the research assistant for Dean Ladd, so they were very close, and Dean was following him out and talking, and the Dean looked at me and said, what can I do for you? I said, well, Dean, I'm, I'm really confused now that I don't have a clerkship, I don't have a job. What do you think I should do? Dean looked at me and said, oh, this is such a coincidence. I just, had, this was meant to be. He said, I, I just have a vacancy that I can slip you into. So he said, how would you like to be Judge, uh, Judge Stevenson's uh, law clerk? I said, well, that'd be okay. So that's so, how I ended up with Judge Stevenson. So this sly guy we've been working for, <laughs> for so many years, this goes way back. Uh, it goes way back. I was manipulative even then, but I think just as a footnote, uh, it's rather humorous. Later on, I did find out why Judge Hanson retained his law clerk. It turned out that his law clerk was single, but had unfortunately uh, his girlfriend had uh, become pregnant, and they were getting married, and if the judge did not retain him, they weren't going to have any insurance for their baby, uh, baby's birth, and the judge, being the kind-hearted man he was, uh, told him he could stay another year. So I literally got screwed out of my friendship <laughs> like that. So. But anyway, at one point, I, th I think when uh, when uh, I was being of uh, my ceremony for uh, becoming a federal judge, Judge Stevenson uh, wasn't with us, but Judge Hanson was. And he went on about how, how I wasn't uh, quite qualified enough to be his law clerk, but uh, anyway, he was grateful that someone found a job for me. And I, uh, when I got my comments, I said, Thank you, Judge Hanson, for not hiring me as a law clerk. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. So, so returning the sir. Yeah, but Judge Hanson and Judge Stevenson both became very dear friends, and I uh, treasured my relationship with both of them. Well, that was um, that was a great system. It's something to be said for having uh, just one person assign the clerk to you, it, rather than the hundreds it, of applications I, we get now. It made it a lot easier. Yeah. And. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, Dean Ladd's no longer around to do it, but he had a knack of uh, matching the right people. So how did you uh, first meet Judge Stevenson? Did you just come I, to work? Well, actually, he was at a, uh, uh, some type of seminar at Iowa, and uh, they were having a break, and uh, out. there was a little area. We were in the old law school there, or the interim law school that was uh, started in 1962 at the Iowa Commons, but that's where the law school was in those days. And there was a little area uh, outside the law school when they had uh, functions, would have little uh, drinks and uh, food set up. So they were having one of those.
Jones and Jed Stevenson and his wife Betty were there. And I just went over and introduced myself and told him I was his new uncle and that's how I met him. And then I actually came to work in July of 62 and he was uh, in Europe at that time. So I, I think I spent three weeks uh, here before he came and uh, then the rest is history, I guess. Well, tell me of your first impressions of Judge Stevenson. Uh, dynamic, intimidating, and uh, uh, just a wonderful human being. He, he uh, one thing about Judge Stevenson, you, you always knew where he stood, <laughs> and he, uh, he certainly literally laid the law down to anyone in his court. He was. He was in control of the courtroom all the way, and uh, he did not hold back when a lawyer displeased him. He let the lawyer know that in no certain terms. The amazing thing is that the judge could uh, could uh, be yelling at a lawyer in uh, the courtroom, and uh, 10 minutes later, they'd be back in the chambers uh, uh, drinking coffee and telling jokes, and think they're the best buddies in the world. But uh, Judge Stevenson was, was just a very, uh, very dedicated man who loved the law and he gave it all his all. He loved being in the courtroom. He uh, loved trying cases and he loved the interplay he had with lawyers. I'm not sure the lawyers always enjoyed it, but he, uh, he certainly did. He's just a wonderful, warm human being. Do you think that you still carry with you today as a judge things that you learned from Judge Stevenson? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think the idea of, of trying to make sure that everyone has the fair opportunity to present their side of the case trying to go into a case without any, uh, any uh, preconceived ideas, trying to maintain an open mind, and uh, particularly uh, trying to accommodate the jury whenever possible. That uh, he, would, he was very sensitive to the fact that jurors were, uh, were undergoing a substantial imposition by serving as jurors, and he wanted to make the time, uh, uh, utilize the time to the best uh, it could be utilized and make sure that things were, uh, they were presented in a fashion that would uh, be understandable and provide for as prompt resolution of the matter as possible. But he, uh, he loved the law, he respected the court, and uh, he, uh, he he just insisted that you treat the court with dignity, and I've always uh, carried that with me. He, he always said, "Remember, it, it's not you that the the honoring; it's the court, and you have to maintain that uh, that degree of uh, respectability for the court at all times." Judge Stevenson was uh, famous for the, the quote, uh, no one is good enough to be a judge, you just do the best you can. Um, have you found that to be true? That's true. I mean, there's, there's just, uh, you know, if you start being too, too sensitive to things that can overwhelm you, and I think the whole idea is you just prepare, give it the best, uh, uh, thought process uh, that you are capable of and then make a decision and uh, move on and don't fret over it once it's done. I, one thing Judge Stevenson told me, and I, I found that so true over the years, particularly when sentencing individuals, sentencing is a very difficult procedure and uh, you put in a lot of time and effort in studying the cases and uh, trying to arrive at a proper decision for each individual. But what you have to do is once you've done that, you have to move on and let it go 
and not fret over what, whether or not you've done the right thing. And I, he taught me that. He uh, showed me how to do it. And over the years, I found it very helpful to do that, and also very critical. I, I have actually counted the number of people I've sentenced, but I think over the years now it's approaching uh, probably around 2,000. And uh, obviously there's some of those I remember, and, uh, but the, there's, you just got to let them go and move on and not worry about whether or not you did the right thing. You were here for a couple of years with Judge Stevenson. Who were the other law clerks you worked with in those days? Well, uh, when I came, I, I uh, succeeded Ed Parr, who uh, went on with the Bradshaw firm and was a successful attorney there. I think he retired a couple of years ago. Uh, and then when, uh, at that time, the judge only had one law clerk, and then during, so I was originally hired to only be here one year. And during that year, Congress authorized a second clerkship for the judge. So uh, the judge allowed me to stay for a second year, and the uh, next law clerk that came along to join us was Don Britton, who was a friend of mine in law school and then graduated in 66. So Don came in the summer of 66, and we served as Judge Stevenson's, uh, Judge Stevenson's first uh, uh, law clerks as a twosome. So uh, those were the two uh, as a clerk. And then, of course, uh, when I came back as a clerk of court, uh, there were a number of other law clerks that I got to serve with and get close to, like uh, Lance Coppock and Ed Remsburg, who are still with the Always Law Firm. And, a number of others, always law firm, and a number of others. And of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the specific case that was involved. But uh, uh, much, much later in your career, uh, Don Britton was at right in the ATM case. Yes. But, uh, yeah. But he, uh, so they came back, and then uh, Don also got appointed in. Uh, a case of Morrissey case that Judge Stevenson appointed him on that dealt with the prisoner's right to a hearing on uh, post-conviction uh, procedures and due process rights. And that case actually ended up going to the Supreme Court and Don got to argue that case in front of the Supreme Court and won it and established uh, some landmark law with regard to uh, prisoners post conviction rights. Still stands as a signal Still case does. in that area. Well, tell me, what other um, cases of significance do you recall uh, that stand out in your memory when you were serving as a law clerk for Church State? Well, I suppose, suppose the one that comes to mind is that everyone uh, remembers and stills in the news is the Tinker v. v. Des Moines School District. Uh, that was tried when I was a law clerk. And uh, was we sat, I sat to the trial, and uh, it was a non-jury case, of course. So uh, we uh, wrote the opinion, and of course it was uh, uh, some young students who were attending Roosevelt, who uh, during the height of the Vietnam War had decided to wear black armbands to school as a matter of protest to the Vietnam War. And judge and uh, the school district had banned that and suspended them for doing that, and that's when uh, the lawsuit was brought uh, against the school district for that action. Uh, it was a rather interesting hearing, and uh, I think Judge Herrick, judge who was a, a, a court's lawyer at that time, but everybody still referred to him as Judge Herrick because he was a a former state court judge and uh, uh, Mr. Langdon and I think Ed Biddle were uh, lawyers representing the school district and of course Dan Johnson at that time was representing the, uh, the Tinkers. And uh, of course very interesting issues about the rights of students, First Amendment rights in the school setting. 
And Judge Stevenson didn't struggle with the case, but he was very concerned that the black armbands being worn in that setting would cause some disruption in the school district because it was his concern that obviously there may be other people in the school who had brothers or sisters serving in the war and would, uh, would cause hard feelings and disrupt the classroom and uh, the school activities. And more or less on that basis and deferring to the judgment of the the school authorities, he thought that it was proper to enforce that rule. Well, the case got appealed, and uh, they actually affirmed the judge a 4-4 decision. And then, of course, it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, in the landmark case, uh, reversed it. Uh, it was a 7-2 decision and determined uh, the case adversely to the Des Moines uh, School District it ruled that the students did have a right to wear the armbands. But I, I think this is an example, and it taught me a lesson too, is that I don't think that Judge Stevens is necessarily the reached the wrong decision, but he did not have the record to support it. There was nothing in the record showing that there was any disruption. And as I recall, uh, there really was, was very little testimony about the possibility of it. It just was something that the, the judge himself felt strongly about uh, and more or less uh, uh, used it as a basis for his opinion, but the record did not support it and uh, the case got, uh, got reversed. But, but there's another interesting aspect to it, and I should go back and look at the case, but, but if you go back and look at Judge Stevenson's opinion in that case, uh, it's obviously published, there's a very interesting footnote in that opinion. And what it deals with is the Tinker children were all wearing black armbands to school, uh, including obviously the, the young uh, uh, children who were in high school, but there also were younger children. I think one like in the first grade and maybe another one like in the third grade who also were wearing black armbands to school, which led the judge to believe that it was the parents who were using the children to uh, project their own uh, concerns or protests to the war, and uh, quite frankly, that upset him. So I think that footnote tells a lot about oh, maybe some of the reasons the judge ended up with the decision he did. But anyway, it was a very interesting decision and uh, obviously allowed me to Sit, on, sit in on a very historical trial. Sometimes you have to look a little closer to figure out um, what the, uh, the motivation was, and, and I'm remembering a case involving a draft dodger that occurred in, in that similar period of time. Uh, do you yeah. recall that? His name was Stephen Smith, and uh, at that time it was, become, it was becoming uh, quite common for people to protest the war by burning their draft cards. Obviously the draft was still in force in those years and many, uh, many young people were being drafted. Uh, so there was a, an, a student down in Iowa City named Stephen Smith who decided that he was going to protest the war and they called uh, the press uh, and to the steps of the Memorial Union and really made quite a, a deal out of it. And uh, he took out his draft card and burned it on the steps with uh, the cameras going and uh, indicated that it was to protest the war and he would never allow himself to serve in that unjust war. Uh, and this actually turned into the first case where someone was indicted uh, for that protest. And uh, obviously it came uh, in the Southern District of Iowa, so it came before Judge, uh, Judge Stevenson. 
And uh, in that regard, there was a trial, uh, and he was convicted, uh, which was no surprise to anyone. But then the uh, most anticipated event was, was what would happen to the young man in sentencing. And he sentenced, there was no mandatory minimum, but there was a maximum year, uh, a maximum sentence of five years imprisonment. I might mention that Judge Stevenson had an extensive military background and served in the World War II, been involved in heavy fighting in Africa and Italy, fought Rommel in Northern Africa, and had many, uh, many wartime stories and uh, had served in the uh, Iowa National Guard and eventually retired as a general. So he had that background of being very military oriented. So people were anticipating what he would do to this young man and how harshly he would treat him at sentencing. And the judge really struggled with this sentence. I know the uh, a couple of days before the sentencing, we traveled to Davenport to hold uh, court, and we talked all the way over about what he should do and the pros and cons of what uh, what should be done. And uh, but he didn't tell me what he was going to do, so we came back to the day of sentencing, and uh, as I uh, uh, followed the judge in the courtroom, I had no idea what he was going to do. So. Uh, we went through the sentencing colloquy and uh, everything was done. And finally, the judge pronounced his sentence, and the sentence was uh, he gave Mr. Smith probation on the condition that within five, I'm sorry, within 10 days, he obtained a new draft card and carry it with him at all times while he was on probation. And that if he didn't do that, he could serve five years in jail. Uh, so the judge, the, the end of the story is he got the new draft card and he's, he completed his probation. But as I, as the judge left that bench that day, I went into chambers and helped him up with his robe and was hanging it up for him. And I said, Judge, you really surprised me with that sentence. I, I really didn't think that's what you'd do. And he said, well, you know, I thought long and hard about it, but when it really came down to it, I'd be damned if I was going to make a martyr out of that little son of a bitch. <laughs> so it's amazing what, what the, sometimes we base our decisions on. Judge Stevenson had a reputation for being um, uh, pretty tough on white-collar crime. Um, first of all, do you think that was a, a justified reputation? And secondly, did, did you carry any of that with you? It's a very justified reputation, but particularly in the area of tax evaders. He, uh, of course, he had been U.S. attorney for uh, seven years prior to his appointment to the bench, and he had prosecuted quite a few uh, uh, people for failure to file income tax fraud. And uh, when those cases came before him as a district court judge, he felt very strongly that they should spend some time in jail. There were a substantial number of judges around the country who thought that probation was sufficient. Uh, in fact, uh, the judge in the Northern District uh, of Iowa always put them on probation, and uh, Judge Stevenson never put them on probation. And uh, he felt very strongly that uh, people who uh, cheated uh, on their income tax and were convicted of it were every bit as uh, guilty of uh, a heinous crime as somebody who went in and robbed a bank. And, he thought the only way to teach those people a lesson and also provide deterrence was to make them serve some time in jail. Now, never was a long time, but uh, six months to 12 months usually was the time uh, he did place them in jail. And uh, ironically, when, when years later, when they were considering the sentencing guideline and the need for the disparity, in sentences and 
uh, or the need to, to address the dispiriting sentences. One of the examples they gave was the example of Iowa where uh, income tax evaders got one sentence in the southern district and one in the northern. So, no, he, he felt very strongly about that. And people convicted in his court of uh, white collar crime could count and spend some time in jail. And I uh, was carried over. I, 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 I've done the same thing many times. So in those days, if you were defending a tax evader, you wanted to find some way to get him into the Northern District. There, there was uh, Mr. Ingersoll, who of course was a very prominent lawyer in, uh, in Cedar Rapids, uh, defended a lot of income tax evaders, and he did everything he could to get the case to the Northern District. But of course, the government had the uh, had so I had the, the last uh, say in that so many times because they could get just the venue jurisdiction in the southern district just by the fact I think at that time the returns had to be filed in Des Moines so they uh, they brought a lot of cases here. Recognizing, of course, that uh, uh, all of the cases that you would have been working on in those days were uh, of significance, and we can't talk about all of them, but are there some others uh, that you recall from that period of time that uh, you felt were important cases long term? Those two are the ones that really stand out. Okay. Uh, so you left, um, you left Judge Stevenson and went into private practice. Uh, so the federal court lost your attention for a little while. Not long, but I, no, I left in uh, July of 67 and then returned in uh, May of, uh, May 1 of 68 to become clerk of court. So I, I went with a small law firm called uh, Monk Williams, Groats and Kirtley that was over in the Hubble building. It was a general trial practice and uh, joined that firm uh, in July of 68 and was getting involved in some trial practice at that level and joined it. And you get a call from Judge Stevenson. And I get a call. Well, actually, uh, in, in December of that year, the firm merged into a, uh, another firm, Williams and Hart. So we went from being a four-man law firm into probably a 12-person law firm. And things were shifting just a little bit. And uh, uh, so one of the partners I was particularly close with, Leo Gross, ended up leaving. And so, so things weren't going totally well uh, in the practice at that time. And then in January, I got called from, January 68, I got called from, Judge uh, Stevenson, who suggested that his clerk of court and U.S. commissioner, it was a combined job, was going to retire, and would I consider uh, talking to him about that job? So I did and uh, came over. In fact, Franz Van Alstein, and I probably should have got a picture of uh, Franz and me on May 1 right here when uh, we. Uh, that date when uh, I was sworn in, Fudge was showing me as a uh, his desk. Uh, but I think Fudge at that time was around 68. I was actually just turned 27 years old, so I became clerk, clerk of court and U.S. commissioner at. Uh, the tender age of 27. And you were replacing uh, Franz, who was uh, well, one of the great characters of the federal he, courts. He was a character. He was a U.S. Uh, uh, attorney for the Northern District in the 50s at the same time Judge Stevenson was a uh, U.S. attorney here in the Southern District. And then uh, when the uh, of course, when the Kennedy administration took over in the 60s, uh, that ended that position, and Franz then came down and joined Judge Stevenson as his clerk of court and served there for uh, eight years. But he was a character, and uh, in fact, uh, he had prosecuted the, the uh, last case in Iowa that resulted in a death penalty back in 19, 
Well, in the early 1960s, I think that uh, a doctor had been kidnapped up in Waterloo and taken to Illinois and chained to tree and uh, killed. And Franz did prosecute that case and did, ended up, ended up uh, imposing the death penalty uh, on the defendant. And I think until the recent case we had a couple of years ago from uh, Sioux City was uh, the last uh, death penalty conviction in Iowa. In fact, was that the case that was actually the last uh, execution in the state of Iowa? Was actually right. a federal execution? Right, but, but there's, a, there's not been one yet uh, since. Uh, obviously, I think there's two individuals who've been convicted, and that's on appeal right now. So you come back to the uh, federal court family uh, as uh, the clerk of court and uh, commissioner, and um, I think it might be useful to have you give us a comparison of what the court organization was like then as compared to what it's like now. Well, w when I came back in 68, it was remarkable what the courts looked in, like in those days as to compared to now. First of all, it was a completely open courthouse. Uh, all the doors were open. Uh, you could walk into any door you wanted to, north, south, uh, east, or west, and uh, no one would be there to inspect you to see if you had a weapon. Uh, but they were open uh, from like seven to six, and. Uh, no, there was no security post at any doors. In fact, one of the problems we had in those days is, uh, even in those days, we had uh, uh, people who would sleep under the bridges, uh, the homeless, uh, uh, and uh, they used to like to come in and use the bathroom and clean up about 7 a.m. Uh, as soon as the doors opened. And uh, we made a compromise with them that that was all right as long as they were out by 7.30, no one would, uh, would bother them. So basically in those days, the, the court facility in the courthouse was located on the second floor. Judge Stevenson had his uh, chambers there. The clerk's office was right across the hallway. And then down the hall was located the uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office on the second floor, along with the Marshal's Office. Uh, it might be uh, interesting to compare the offices. At that time, the U.S. Attorney's Office had the U.S. Attorney and two assistants and had three uh, secretaries, for, so for a total of like six people in the same office. Uh, this may have been 65 when I came as a law clerk that I'm willing to tell you about now, but it was about the same in 68. The uh, marshal, I think, had the U.S. marshal and about four or five deputies. Uh, the clerk's office had the clerk and five deputies here in Des Moines, one in Danport and one in uh, Council Bluffs. Uh, and the probation office had the probation officer, one assistant, and one secretary. Whereas today, I think probation has, what, over 30 people, U.S. attorney has over 60, Marshall has probably, what, 15 or so, and uh, clerk's office, I think, has over 30. So it's, it's amazing the, the change of personnel. And one of the interesting things was at that time, uh, Whenever we needed to know on the status of a prisoner, whether or not he was being held for trial or what, what, what stage his uh, criminal case was in, we'd find out by going to a blackboard that was maintained in the marshal's office. And there were usually between 10 and 20 names on that blackboard. And you look at the blackboard and break, keep it up to date by just erasing and writing in the current stats. That's how you maintained the uh, who was in jail uh, in federal custody. Today we get a printout daily of our prisoner list of individuals in custody 
at some stage of the criminal prosecution. Last time I looked at that list, it was approaching 600 individuals. So uh, that's amazing transformation in our criminal uh, process and uh, the, the criminal aspect of our uh, federal court uh, here in Des Moines and Danport. Uh, but at any rate, in addition to the court facilities, all the investigating agencies had, a, had an office here in the, the courthouse, the FBI, the Secret Service, Treasury, they all had. Uh, the DEA just created an office here in Des Moines in the late 60s, and they had an office here. The fourth floor was totally uh, handled or, or taken over by the Agriculture Department. They had uh, the entire floor. The weather, the, the National Weather Bureau had an office up on top of the fourth floor that uh, has a little cupola up there that uh, most people don't know about. And then actually uh, the, on the ground floor we had a soil testing facility where the oil, the agriculture department was testing their soil. And then where we are today on this floor uh, was the Internal Revenue Service and it's the entire south end of the, uh, of the uh, first floor. So it was a, and then of course they did build a courtroom for Judge Stevenson and actually where you are now, Jim, on the first floor on the north side. So those facilities were in under construction in the 60s. So, but that's how the courthouse looked and the staff, uh, staffing of it was when I came back as clerk in 68. And now, of course, the, the entire building, with the exception of the marshal service, which is a necessary adjunct, the, the entire building is taken up by the court. Right, and uh, agencies and U.S. attorney and even the probation office now has been moved into the annex, so it just costs the parking lot. Was bankruptcy in this building? I'm sorry, bankruptcy was on third floor. Uh, Judge Stageman was uh, actually in those days, they started calling them bankruptcy judges in the mid, uh, mid uh, 60s, but when he was appointed, he was known as a bankruptcy referee. And uh, in fact, he had a referee shirt he used to wear every once in a while. And he was feeling a feisty, which uh, he did a lot of times. And, uh, he, uh, but he, he was the referee at that time, had a small courtroom on the third floor, and uh, the entire office was located on the third floor. People, of course, would understand the, the essential function of the clerk of court, although that was well in advance of the electronic uh, sort of operation that we have today. Uh, but uh, tell me about this position as United States Commissioner. Okay, well, essentially it did the preliminary uh, criminal matters. Uh, issued warrants, uh, conducted uh, preliminary hearings uh, if necessary, uh, issued arrest warrants and search warrants, and uh, did preliminary hearings uh, uh, and and uh, initial hearings for an arraignment. Uh, like when they got arrested, they'd come in and uh, the commissioner would be responsible for informing them of their rights and uh, seeing if they had a lawyer and if they didn't, uh, arranging for the appointment of a lawyer. A couple of things about that that might be of interest is the commissioner was not paid a salary. Uh, the commissioner was paid uh, uh, by what he did. I think he got four dollars for entering an arrest warrant, and maybe six dollars for uh, for uh, holding an initial appearance. But, but it was a, a piecemeal job, and you essentially. Uh, yeah, kept track of what you did, and at the end of the quarter or whatever, they give you a check based on what you did. Uh, and one of the real interesting uh, things that I think we tend to forget about now is that in those days, uh, there was no Criminal Justice Act panel, 
But instead, when someone needed a lawyer and could not afford the lawyer, the uh, commissioner or clerk would simply uh, call one of the members of our, board, our, uh, our bar and inform them that they were now representing a criminal defendant. And we would call members of the Dickerson firm, and the Toma firm at that time, and Bradshaw firm, and uh, uh, e even the ones who were not trial lawyers. If they were a member of our bar, they were subject to receiving a criminal appointment. And uh, many of them uh, did. And uh, of course, there were a few protests, but. Uh, they really, as long as they wanted to stay a member of the Southern District of Iowa, they had to take those appointments and uh, complete them. And uh, it really was was done that way until the Criminal Justice Act passed in the 70s. And uh, you not only did you not receive any money for your service, uh, there was really no money available for any expenses you had. So it was quite an uh, undertaking to, uh, to be a member of the bar, and particularly if uh, someone ended up going to trial, it would take a substantial amount of your practice. But that was uh, part of being a professional and uh, being a member of our bar, and for the most part, the uh, lawyers uh, willingly uh, took them and uh, all still an outstanding job. And in 1970, the uh, magistrate judge system became a part of the court that system. Came that, the act actually passed, uh, I think, in 68, and then Iowa created a uh, U.S. United States magistrate system and actually appointed U.S. magistrates in late 1970. And uh, I was appointed here in Des Moines. I was still, of course, clerk of court, so I served both as clerk of court and U.S. magistrate. Uh, Longtime friend, senior in uh, Council Bluffs, Dick Peterson, uh, who had served as a uh, U.S. commissioner since the late 50s, was appointed as a U.S. magistrate in uh, 1970. And then we had uh, one in I was sitting one in Denport and one in Burlington. So I think there were five of us part-time magistrates who implemented the system at that time. Was there only one uh, eventual full-time position? Yeah, it, it, we maintained that until 1976. And at that time, they created a full-time a magistrate position for the Southern District of Iowa. In fact, it was the first um, full-time magistrate position for Iowa. And uh, I applied for and uh, got that job. And uh, the, the, the standards of getting the job were not quite as severe in those days. Uh, the, I think now it's, uh, as you know, quite a process to apply. And there's, uh, 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 committees set up and recommendations made and a uh, long list of applicants for that job is it's such an outstanding job. In 1976, uh, uh, basically I got called to Judge Stevenson's uh, uh, chambers. Uh, uh, actually, by that time, Judge Stevenson was on the Court of Appeals. But he had always anticipated that that was a job that was coming along and one that would be really a, a great fit for me. And of course, Judge Stewart had taken Judge uh, Stevenson's place in 70, 71, and then Judge Hanson was still here. So they were the ones who were selecting the, uh, the new magistrate judge who it would be. And uh, I don't believe. They actually, I don't believe it was open for uh, applications. I think uh, once uh, the position was authorized, uh, uh, so they just said, would you like it? I said, absolutely, and they said, you have it. So uh, rightly or wrongly, that's how, how I started as a U.S. magistrate and was sworn in on March 1 of 76. 
and then um, you served in that capacity until 1991. Right. So uh, a long period of time as a magistrate judge. And in, in this district, uh, although there was certainly early on some level of controversy about the scope of responsibilities for magistrate judges uh, in our circuit, uh, in this district it was always uh, pretty generously uh, approached, was it not? Yeah. The, the, first of all, the, the judges fully supported the concept of the magistrate position and uh, saw it as being an integral part of, of the court system. And they encouraged the use of the magistrate to the full extent uh, in the law, and that included uh, having trials of civil cases by consent of the parties, which they encouraged. And then they turned over to the magistrate all the uh, preliminary matters uh, like uh, pre-trials, uh, discovery matters, et cetera. Anything up till the time of trial, they, or a mo motion for summary judgment or other dispositive motion, they said that belongs to the magistrate. You do it, you run with it. I don't want to see the trial. I don't want to see the case till it's ready for trial unless a dispositive motion is uh, filed. So. With uh, those marching orders, I basically uh, developed a system where I was doing all the pretrial work both here in Des Moines and in Danbury and Council Bluffs for the court. You may have uh, some additional ideas about cases during that magistrate judge period that, uh, that we should be bringing up, but there are a couple of them I want to ask you about. Um, first of all, a judge judging a judge, uh, the uh, Siebenman case. Um, involving the, uh, of course, judges normally enjoy judicial immunity, but on occasion they're asked to do something in their responsibility that is not a judicial act, but rather an administrative act. And so the question in that case is whether the judge uh, was exposed uh, to uh, uh, personal responsibility for his administrative acts. You remember Stevenman? Oh, very well. Very well. You were my law clerk, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, I was back in the late 70s. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, uh, there was a, a young lady, I think her name was Atchison, right? Yeah. And uh, she was a probation officer, and uh, she had been terminated by Judge Sieberman uh, for what he deemed to be inappropriate activities. I guess maybe I forget all the details of what she was doing, but at least she was terminated. She sued him for such discrimination at that time, and of course he uh, claimed judicial immunity and uh, asked that the lawsuit be, uh, be thrown out. And uh, uh, my brilliant law clerk told me that that probably didn't need to be, uh, was uh, supported by the case law. So I think basically what, what, what was decided at that time was that the act of terminating a probation officer was not the type of act that you were, and a judge was entitled to claim judicial immunity for. Uh, so the case went on to trial and was tried on the merits, and uh, I uh, actually determined that she was discriminated against, and she was awarded some damages. Uh, I can't recall. I think I'm not sure she was seeking reinstatement, but I, at least she was awarded damages and, and some relief. Well, that case uh, generated a lot of controversy, and uh, particularly among state court judges uh, who were not very happy with my decision at all. And I did get appealed to the Eighth Circuit and actually then got reversed, as I recall. And uh, so, uh, but I think years later there was some cases coming out of the Supreme Court that uh, I, at least my position is I've been vindicated and that we were right. <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, Eighth Circuit uh, uh, although they had the final say in that case, I think ultimately my position was uh, vindicated and uh, 
supported by more recent Supreme Court cases that the judge really isn't entitled to that immunity uh, when he's serving an administrative function like dealing with employees. Another case that generated a lot of controversy and followed you for quite a while uh, was a, a case that uh, arose out of a, a horrible murder that occurred at the Wakanda Shopping Center in uh, Des Moines at the Arnold Palmer uh, cleaning establishment and uh, where a young woman was murdered, beaten to death with one of the golf clubs that had been hanging on the wall. It was the Nickham case. And uh, uh, it was a case in which uh, you concluded that uh, there were constitutional problems. Yeah, that, that was a very controversial case at the time it was tried. And of course, he was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. And then the case, case got, uh, a federal habeas corpus uh, case got filed, and Judge uh, O'Brien was the trial judge. And he did refer that case to me for to get at the hearing and do a report and recommendation. And after carefully reviewing the transcript, I concluded that there were constitutional violations, uh, the main one being a Brady-type violations where the prosecutor had uh, withheld, withheld some very relevant information about another possible perpetrator who might have been in the area at the same time. But based on that, and I, I think there were about three or four other grounds that were examined, and I concluded that the, uh, the uh, Mr. Nickham was entitled to relief and a new trial on all, on all uh, five four or five grounds, so I recommended to judge, uh, the judge that we, uh, Judge O'Brien, that he adopt my opinion and that he actually grant a new trial, grant the Vavius Corpus, grant a new trial, and failing a new trial to, uh, to release the prisoner. Well, I would need to say that was a very unpopular decision because uh, there was very strong feelings about the uh, the murder, and uh, it, it was aggravated by the fact that this beautiful young woman, who was about 19 and 20, and had been severely beaten by the golf club and killed, was also the the daughter of an Iowa State trooper. So the law enforcement community thought, you know had even stronger feelings about that than uh, normal. Well, uh, it got back, it got appealed to the Eighth Circuit, the uh, decision got affirmed, so it was set back for a new trial, which I really had, was not too concerned about because I felt on retrial that there was certainly uh, sufficient grounds to uh, convict him. Well, uh, they started getting ready for the new trial, and it turned out that uh, several years earlier, the clerk of court for Polk County was cleaning out the evidence room and had thrown out all the evidence for that trial. So the prosecutor, the Polk County prosecutor, really was limited in his ability to uh, to pursue the case at that late date. So what they did was they worked out a plea deal where I think he pled guilty to second degree murder, uh, received a sentence that then allowed him to be released, I think, uh, a few years after that time. And I think he was actually released in the late 80s or early 90s He's been uh, living in St. Louis, uh, or at least that's where he went. I don't know if he's still living or not, but I've been holding my breath, hoping he didn't do anything else while he's released. But interestingly enough, and, and you know this well too, that at the time of my nomination to uh, become federal judge in 1991, uh, they were doing the investigation. In fact, they had selected me to be the uh, the pick, the Justice Department, 
uh, hand, and they were finalizing the process. And all of a sudden, I, uh, I get this call and uh, from justice, and uh, the, essentially was, what the hell did you do in the Nickham case? <laughs> and uh, I guess they were getting some pressure from people saying that, you know, this guy, that if you point him, he's going to let, let all the murderers out of uh, Fort Madison Jail. But, Fortunately, we alleviated the concerns and they were able to uh, go ahead and put the appointment. But obviously, some people still, 10 years later, felt pretty strongly still about that uh, decision I made because they, they certainly raised it with the Justice Department in protest to my appointment. Now, uh there was, uh, as we referred to uh, uh, in passing earlier, um, and particularly from Judge Lay, uh, the late Judge Lay, there was some resistance to a lot of authority being exercised by the magistrate judges in those days, but um, you uh, tried a lot of cases. I did. I was very pleased that the lawyers seemed to uh, accept me as a trial judge, although I think that some of them were, were a little hesitancy at first. Uh, but uh, I, I got a substantial volume of consents during uh, my 15 years, tried a lot of cases, a lot of interesting cases. Uh, during one year in the 80s, I probably 87 or 88, I actually tried 22 civil cases by consent during the year which volume-wise, as I look back, astounds me because I think today, uh, civilly, uh, last year I think I tried two civil cases uh, to complete some jury trials. And I dare say if we take our entire uh, uh, judicial uh, resources now uh, with uh, three district court judges and three magistrate judges, uh, I'm not sure we tried a lot of criminal cases, but I'm not sure we tried 20 civil cases if we put us all together. But it's been quite a change in the uh, volume of civil litigation in our court that actually goes up, goes to trial. But I feel very fortunate during those 15 years I got to try a lot of great cases with a lot of great trial lawyers in it. Well, we want to talk um, in some detail about uh, your service as an Article Three judge, and uh, in the process of doing that, let's start with the fact that uh, you didn't uh, become an Article Three judge the first time you tried. No, I. <laughs> what I, were the prior occasions? I, uh, uh, I believe in the saying, "If at first you don't succeed, try, try again." So, but I know that the first vacancy I applied for was in 19, uh, let's see, 78. So I would have uh, um, not been quite 40 years old yet, but there's a vacancy occurred when uh, Judge uh, Judge Hansen took senior status. And at that time, we had uh, two Democratic senators, um, and they decided to let the bar uh, nominate uh, potential applicants. So the bar formed a committee and interviewed uh, substantial number of uh, candidates. I did submit for an interview and uh, felt very fortunate that I was selected as one of the five who uh, were names were submitted to the senators to, uh, uh, for consideration for the federal judgeship. I think I was probably 37 years old at that time. Uh, but the other candidates were Judge Don O'Brien from Sioux City, Judge Held. Vieta from Cedar Rapids, uh, Mark McCormick, who at that time was a lawyer here in Des Moines, and Mark Schatz, who was uh, in practice with the, I think the Dickinson firm at that time. So those were the five names that were submitted. Uh, Judge O'Brien was selected, but uh, interestingly enough, the next year Congress created an additional judgeship for the Southern District of Iowa. So uh, there was another 
uh, opportunity to submit names. I applied again. Uh, same committee, same interview process. Came up with four of the same names as uh, they'd selected before, including mine. And then to replace Judge O'Brien, who obviously was a sitting judge at that time, they selected Claude Freeman. And those, those five names were submitted to, to the uh, uh, to the senators, obviously at that time Judge Vieta was selected and became a judge, I think, in 79. Uh, the next vacancy was created when my good friend Judge Stewart took senior status in uh, 86, and he'd been a judge since, uh, since Judge Stevenson in uh, 71 and was a remarkable man and a, a very dear friend to me. But he took senior status and I did apply for that vacancy. And at that time, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Wiley Pillars from uh, uh, Eastern Iowa and- uh, Clinton, Dick, wasn't it? Clinton, yeah. you're right, Clinton had the firm over there. And uh, Dick Turner from, uh, who was, uh, U.S. Attorney uh, applied, and uh, they and I applied, and the three of us were selected to uh, to have our names submitted to justice. So I again made the list, but again the result was the same. Uh, they selected uh, Wiley Pillars to be the uh, the uh, to be his name to be submitted to justice, but in the process uh, uh, it was withdrawn and uh, then rather than uh, limit themselves to Dick Turner and uh, myself, they decided to select another name and uh, that's when Judge Woolley, who was on the Supreme Court, uh, entered uh, his name at that time and he was selected to be the judge in uh, I think he came in in 87. So I was 0 for 4 at that point. But fortunately, there was a, another judgeship created for Iowa in uh, 1991. And this was a judgeship that was divided half towards uh, Northern District and half towards Southern District because at that time, Judge uh, O'Brien was serving as a half-time judge in the Northern District, half-time judge in the Southern District, so they decided to eliminate that position and just put, give each uh, district a, a half position so uh, they'd no longer be in shared position. So Judge uh, O'Brien, of course, was in Sioux City, so he opted to take the position in the Northern District. That created a vacancy here in Des Moines. And I, again, for the fifth time, applied. And uh, that time I was 50 years old and again made the list to be submitted. Uh, I guess for me the fifth time was charm because I did, I was selected. Uh, that time uh, the other names were uh, <laughs> Judge Laws and his name was, uh, and then from uh, a trial judge from uh, Clinton. Uh, oh, yeah, Charlie Clinton. Charlie, 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 Charlie Clinton. Right, yeah. So those three names were submitted, and uh, we went through the process with all the end of Washington and were interviewed by Justice, and uh, then I was notified that they'd selected me and went through the process, and as you said earlier, in uh, November I became federal judge and fulfilled a dream I'd had for a long time. The process at that time, um, uh, I want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, um, in, in those days you were, you were interviewed at Justice and you went into Washington uh, to do that and uh, you spoke uh, earlier of, the, uh, of your disability that isn't a disability. Uh, that uh, I remember the fellow at Justice uh, looking at the sheet and saying, well, it says here that you have uh, uh, some disabilities. Uh, 
when do when does that happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we we were able to deal with that without too much trouble. He ended up deciding there was no issue there. Was there. No issue. Uh, but I, I have to have you share. Um, after you had interviewed at the Justice Department, uh, uh, j just to bring it up to speed, uh, in those days uh, I had been your law clerk, and your law clerk at the time was married to a uh, insurance executive of some note, and uh, uh, when we went into Washington for this occasion, um, you had a limousine. Right. Uh, when when uh, we, uh, we went in for an interview, and uh, I was fortunate to uh, have you and my law clerk there to support me, and she brought along her husband, who always decided to travel in style, and uh, wherever he went, he had a limousine. So uh, when uh, that that day uh, we met for breakfast, when the day I was interviewing, I think uh, uh, three of you went over to have uh, breakfast with somebody in the Senate. At the Senate dining room, and at the same time, I went to uh, to uh, the Justice Department and was dropped off in a limousine, which I wasn't sure that was the proper way to make an impression or not. But anyway, I uh, got there, went, spent the whole morning uh, as uh, through interviews and talked to a lot of lawyers, and, and the last person. Uh, I talked to was a non-lawyer, but he was the in charge. He essentially was in charge of the appointment process. Is the political arm of the uh, Justice Department. His name was Moy Murray Dickman, and he was from Pennsylvania. And he was really a character. And from the minute I walked in, we just hit everything off right. Everything went well. Every uh, every uh, question seemed to click, and we just did everything right. And and I knew I was in good shape because I knew my other two uh, uh, individuals had been selected, uh, had been in for interviews the previous week, and he was looking to see the names. They said, you know, I don't know if those other two have been in for interviews or not, I can't remember <laughs> whether they're here. So he looked at me and said, yeah, I guess they have been in. So I, I felt pretty good about the process. But at any rate, we, uh, we finished it, and then by pre-arrangement, I met uh, uh, you and uh, my court law clerk, Laney Van Orsdale, and uh, her husband, Bill, we, we met for uh, lunch at the Ebbets, uh, Oh, Evans Grill. Evans Grill, okay. So we uh, we were there and were having lunch, and uh, lo and behold, Murray Dickman, who I just talked to, who I knew was going to be the key to my whole future, walked in. And he happened to be with a very attractive young lady, right? Yes. And uh, a blonde. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I made a step decision that maybe I better not push the issue and we just let him walk by to see us. We had a delightful lunch, assume he did too. But anyway, as we exited the, the building or the grill, we had the limousine waiting for us. And we got in. And as we were leaving, we noticed that Murray was just staying on the corner with this attractive blonde. And, and, uh, fond farewell, and they went their own separate ways. And the limousine took us back to the hotel. And we, uh, as we approached the hotel, Laney just said, oh, I forgot my purse at the grill. We're going to have to go back and get it. So uh, I said, well, you're here. Why don't you, uh, you and Jim just drop you off at the hotel, and we'll see you later. So you and I got out of the limousine and started walking to the hotel. The limousine drove off. I took about three steps towards the hotel, and I was face to face with Murray Dickman, <laughs> who then looked at me and said, oh, not bad transportation for a little old magistrate from Iowa. <laughs> and I said, 
You know, that's really something to me. My locals think so much of me, they made sure I had this uh, the transportation to make sure I would, uh, I'd be comfortable in a big city. So uh, he said, well, that's great. I said, by the way, boy, I just saw you over at the Edwards Grill. You looked like you were having a pretty good time. He said, yeah, you know something? It's the first person I've talked to all day that didn't want to be a federal judge. <laughs> and I said, yeah, boy, and I bet if she wanted it, she could get it. <laughs> so so uh, about a week later, Murray was out to uh, Iowa. Drake was having the annual banquet, and uh, Attorney General was, what, Th Thornburg? Thornburg? Yes. Thornburg was uh, the guest speaker. And Murray Dickman had, had actually been there that day. Well, I was with him, and we were all invited to the banquet. So, you know, uh, Thornburg was there, and all the other candidates and their supporters were rushing up to talk to Thornburg and tell him uh, who they should make a federal judge. And I was sitting there, and I was with my wife, Norma, and she said, well, aren't you going to talk to him? I said, no, I'm going to wait and talk to Boyd Dickman because he's the one who's going to make the decision. Well, my old friend Barney Dawson was there, and he uh, had played to say to Murray, and then Boy saw me and walked up to me. I introduced him to uh, uh, my wife, and all he said to her was, did he bring you in a limousine tonight? <laughs> so uh, I obviously made an impression, and... Uh, they called us for dinner at that time, and I started to walk in, and Murray uh, grabbed me by the arm and said, you're going to be a federal judge. So <laughs> that's how I found out about it, and that was a cute story, but it's absolutely true, and you were, you were there to witness it, right? I witnessed all of it except uh, that last part where that Murray told part. you you had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was in private. Okay. All right, so you get it, uh, and, uh, and you... Uh, you take the next step to, as, as you said, the, uh, the dream job. And uh, when you come to the job of judging, tell me what it is that you have found a judge needs to have personal qualities uh, to do the job appropriately. Well, you, you just need to try. First of all, I think it's very important to try to maintain your health and, and uh, keep a positive attitude towards life because without that you really have no business judging other people if you have worries about your your uh, health or, or about other issues in your life so i think it's very important to, to be able to deal with those and come to the courthouse uh, feeling good and uh, with a very positive attitude about life and about your job. And then I think it's very important to remember that whatever case you're hearing that day, or whatever proceeding you're involved in, to the people in front of you, whether it be a criminal case or a civil case, is one of the most important things in their life, in the life of their family. And each one needs to be dealt with thoroughly and with all the patience and courtesy that you can provide them. And the key is to be well prepared to deal with the issues that are coming up. And uh, uh, then once they're presented to you, I think it's even more important that you realize that even though the decision may not be clear cut, Obviously, if it was clear cut, you wouldn't be involved. Uh, but although there may be a difficult issue and confusion as to where you should, should go, you need to make a decision. And that's what your job is, and you make the best call you can. And uh, once you've done the preparation, make the decision and move on. A little uh, background story in preparation for the question. Uh, uh, when I was uh, early on the bench myself, I was participating in a panel discussion, uh, and one of the other panelists was uh, the late, great Richard Arnold. And uh, 
Judge Arnold, uh, before the panel discussion, uh, stopped and talked to me and he said, Jim, have you developed a sentencing philosophy? And I said, no, sir, I don't believe I have. And he said, well, neither have I. I've been looking for ideas. <laughs> but recognizing that it is kind of a flowing uh, thing, uh, did you find yourself developing a sentencing philosophy and approach to sentencing, and did it change over time? Um, of course, when, when I started in 91, the guidelines were just had a pretty good start at that point. They started in the light, late uh, 80s, so they were still somewhat developing, but they'd become quite entrenched, and they were mandatory, and, and I think at least judges at that time and myself were less likely to depart from the guidelines. Now, now, a lot of people says, well, that just made you sort of mechanical uh, uh, application of guidelines. You really were just a rubber stamp. But that's not true at all. There were a lot of discretion uh, in deciding what guidelines apply and what uh, what caused a sentence to go up and what caused a sentence to go down. And there were a lot of key decisions to be made. I, I think as I started, I tended to be a little more harsh in my sentences than I am today. I, I think uh, as I've aged or matured or however you want to label it, I, uh, I, I probably tend to look, particularly in the drug sentences that we're seeing now, try to look uh, more for ways to relieve a defendant uh, as long as they're not the kingpin or whatever, but as long as uh, uh, to relieve some of our defendants of some of the more severe consequences of the uh, hardship sentence that we've seen. So, uh, but anyway, it's, it's always an interesting process, and every sentence is different. Well, tell me about, um, as a district judge, uh, what cases stand out in your mind as being uh, most significant? Well, one of the more interesting cases I had was a, was a criminal case involving uh, Jack Keim and Randy Bell. And uh, these two gentlemen had decided to uh, uh, start a uh, criminal enterprise in the Des Moines area and more or less acquire a monopoly of uh, criminal activity in Des Moines. Uh, eventually, there were about 25 to 30 individuals who were indicted and convicted in this uh, general conspiracy. Uh, everyone except uh, Kime and Bell pled guilty. They were the only two that went to trial. Uh, but what, what the philosophy was, was that they, they were going to get uh, a, more or less a gang together and they were going to go around and, and uh, uh, steal from all the drug dealers that they know. They'd wait till they had the statues and their, uh, uh, their money and then they'd put on masks and go in and actually rob them. Uh, a lot of times at gunpoint and uh, several times with pistol with them and steal their drugs and uh, money and you know, that's just try to put them out of business and then uh, take over their customers. Uh, and one of the incidents I remember involved uh, that uh, Randy Bell had been in charge of going down to New Mexico and robbing some Mexicans of like a large quantity of marijuana, uh, multiple pounds, I think well over 100 pounds of marijuana. And in doing it, they, they completed the robbery, but then they wanted to teach the, uh, the, the Mexican in charge a lesson and warn him not to come at back, not to retaliate or come after them. So they got him in the back of a van and decided to cut off his finger. So Randy got on top of him and was cutting one of his fingers off. And about this time, the uh, 
the gentleman, for obvious reasons, lost total control of his bowels and everything else and created such a mess that they got disgusted before they got the finger off and just threw him out of the van and uh, severely damaged it. But this all came out at the trial. So, I mean, this was the type of activity they were engaging in. And we had many instances around Des Moines where they were engaging in the robberies of the various uh, uh, cooks around Des Moines. Actually, I, I often thought that maybe we should have let them operate for another year or so, and they pretty well cleaned up the city for us. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, they were indicted. We, we ended up having a four-week trial, very interesting, very contentious trial. And uh, it, uh, a lot of funny stories came, came out of it, but eventually they were convicted and probably by poor Jack Kime and Randy Bell were two of the most uh, dangerous criminals I've ever dealt with. Uh, and I did give them one. Uh, Randy, I think, got 50 years and uh, Jack got 70 years. So. Hopefully we won't be seeing them out anytime soon. There were a couple of funny things that happened during the trial. Uh, one of, in fact, this Mexican who I just told you about who testified, who has finger partially severed, he was asked to identify the uh, the defendant who did that to him, and uh, he pointed the finger right at Joe Patoglia, <laughs> who was representing the. Randy Bell, but uh, so that uh, caused a little dilemma. <laughs> it didn't look too much alike, but uh, and then uh, two of the key witnesses for the government, of course, had already pled guilty and were incarcerated at the time they testified. Uh, at the, they were being held in the Dallas County Jail, which was. Uh, uh, rather small operation in those days, and I think it was 95 when we had the trial. And on weekends, all they had at the jail facility, they had like maybe 12, 15 prisoners, and they had two female guards in charge of the facility during the uh, weekends. And it turned out as we got through the testimony of these individuals that the defendant's lawyers discovered that the, uh, the the two witnesses were actually during the weekends being let out of the cells and having sex with the female guards out in the Dallas County Jail, which led to some interesting issues at trial and uh, also arguments about what the government was willing to do to uh, keep the witnesses happy so they would testify in a proper manner. But it was a very interesting trial. And, they get a peon and affirmed, and uh, it was one of the trials I remember. We spoke earlier of uh, Don Britton and the fact that uh, he was involved in the uh, the case involving the uh, automatic teller machines. Um, that was a fairly significant case uh, in terms of its impact. Right. Tuna, Iowa was one of but it may be only one of two states that did not let banks place ATM machines off site, in other words, in the malls, prey metals, what have you. And uh, they had what they called the Shazam system, which they were quite proud of, and had, had maintained very strict control of the ATM industry. And uh, a bank out of Utah challenged that because they wanted to place ATMs, I think, in Sears uh, uh, stores. And uh, so they challenged the Iowa law, and uh, Don represented the bank, and the case came before me. And I initially found that the, uh, the uh, Iowa had the, was a state uh, regulation that was uh, properly within their purview to regulate and uh, ruled that they could maintain the system and that did get appealed to the Eighth Circuit and got reversed on a 2-1 decision. I I had uh, uh, decided on motion for summary judgment and uh, it got 
as I say, reversed on 2-1. Decision came back to me, uh, and in the retrial, and Don was still uh, with the case at that time. Uh, at that time, I decided, with proper guidance from the Eighth Circuit, I uh, decided that the uh, the state did not have that authority. So I essentially uh, threw out the regulations on the ATM machines, and now we have them all over. And uh, so I suppose, in a way, that's one of the most uh, important decisions I've had in terms of its ultimate effect on the economy of the state of Iowa. A couple of other things that, that uh, was so interesting in terms of civil cases from uh, uh, the impact they've had, although they were pretty low-key at the time, uh, when they started building the uh, bridges out on the interstate, uh, on George Mills Parkway and on 74th Street that essentially both lead to Jordan Creek uh, Mall development. Uh, the uh, uh, environmental group uh, called uh, Thousand Friends, they challenged whether or not they had probably complied with the environmental com uh, uh, impact laws. So they had a lawsuit highly contested of, over whether or not those bridges could even be built. And I uh, heard that case and I allowed them to go ahead with the construction. And similarly with the ML King Parkway, they challenged that too. And I again allowed that construction to go on. So. When I cross all those bridges, I think, well, probably my decision to allow those go on, to go on has uh, certainly uh, had an effect in the economic development of uh, Polk County and Dallas County over the last 10 years. Whether that's good or bad, I, I'll leave for others to judge, but certainly uh, does bring to mind that we really are dealing with real issues and real effects. Uh, on the people and uh, probably uh, around the community. Do you have uh, thoughts uh, as you look back on the years that you've spent on the bench of, uh, of problems in the system, things that have concerned you, made you uncomfortable? Oh, well, I, I guess I've more or less tried to operate uh, Within the cases I uh, I'm assigned to, but I, I, you know I I think the the, the problems as a system and, and even within the courthouse I see are the judges are all different and uh, we all come at things from a different perspective, but I, it, it really bothers me to think that that the result of a, a case or the result of a criminal sentence can depend on the judge to whom you are assigned. And I think it's very important that as we do our job, we understand that we're part of a system and we're not an island unto ourselves. And that our our decisions have to to relate not only to the case before us, but to all the other cases that are being processed in the system. And particularly, I think we're, we're talking about the guidelines, which is the guidelines of sentencing in criminal cases. They have undergone a major uh, uh, revision or modification in recent years in terms of uh, from being mandatory to being uh, advisory to now and to reach decisions being even more advisory than they were before. But I think as we deal with that uh, perhaps newfound freedom in sentencing, it's very important that we take our responsibilities seriously and really really analyze each case in accordance with the fact sentencing factors and do a responsible job not only to the case before us, 
but as it relates to the whole system, because I deeply fear that if the judges don't do that consistently, we're soon going to have Congress imposing uh, mandatory minimums in most of the sentencing uh, areas. It's going to ruin the whole system if we do not responsibly uh, uh, take our duties to uh, give fair and equitable sentences. I want to ask you about a couple of things that are of significant note uh, in this point in history when we're talking. Uh, uh, one is uh, security and uh, the other one is uh, political pressure on uh, judges. So first of all, uh, with security, um, have you had uh, uh, unusual experiences uh, with security either at the court or personal? Well, generally the modules take very good care of us and uh, we, we are in a very safe environment. Uh, recently, uh, I have had some death threats that came up uh, that summer, and uh, uh, as a result of the trial, I had uh, in all sets, I had uh, a couple of gentlemen who got convicted of an arson down in Iowa City who were not happy with my sentence. I gave them each 30 years, and they were going around uh, trying to hire someone to burn my house down, and the marshals were unsure of whether or not they'd succeeded. So, they actually had watchers uh, uh, posted at my home every evening during the summer for probably about six, eight weeks until they were sure that the threat had passed. But they take very good care of us. They, the only incident that comes to mind is uh, back in the late 90s, I was conducting a five defendant drug trial and uh, been a very contentious trial. And we were, uh, in, in fact, we were in the second floor courtroom because of the large number of people involved. And we were taking the verdict. The uh, jury had come in, and we were just starting to take the verdict. And the uh, there were five defendants. Four of them were, were pretty well convicted. The fifth was really on the borderline and had a good chance of getting off. Well, when they started to pull the jury, they started with the guy who had the best chance to get off. And he got found guilty. So it was soon apparent to the others where they were headed. Well, the one who got found guilty, I of course had stand up first, and he was the nearest to the jury. Well, rather than sit down, he started expressing his displeasure with the jury in rather obscene terms and a loud voice, and then actually even taken some steps towards the jury. And I had immediately uh, uh, asked the marshals to remove him from the courtroom just so we could go on with the process. And in doing so, they got him to the very back of the courtroom where the door at that time went in, still does I think, but went back into where the security of the cells were. So they got him clear to the back door and somehow he got his feet up on the wall and was able to push back and got himself released. That was a, was a big mistake on his part because about two seconds later he had all kinds of modules on top of him. and. Uh, Jeff Murley's, uh, who was in the, that time, pulled out his uh, his mates and sprayed the mates in the uh, face of the guy, completely uh, incapacitated him. Unfortunately, within about 10 seconds, <laughs> it incapacitated the rest of the courtroom, too. <laughs> uh, I never realized how... Uh, how how prolific that was. Maybe he had a high part to spray, I don't know. But they finally subdued him, took him out, but everybody in the courtroom was soon was choking, including the juror, jury. So we had to clear the courtroom. But I took the, uh, of course, at this time, the four remaining defendants were yelling and shouting too. 
So we just had to clear the courtroom. I took the jury back through chambers into the library. We were all uh, having eyes were stinging, copying. So we got all the jurors wet towels and got them straightened up. Unfortunately, we still had four verdicts we had to take. So after about a half hour delay, we went back, we went upstairs to the courtroom on Fort Four and took the remaining uh, remaining verdicts. Of course, they were all guilty, and we got everybody calmed down. And uh, then at that time, we had the jury remained, and we talked to them, and got the opinions of the whole process, and uh, what had gone on, and asked them if they'd seen anything uh, which would be inappropriate. And they were all very pleased for the way the system was handled. But, that was certainly the most dramatic thing I ever had in the courtroom in terms of disruption. On your personal security, I was also impressed uh, that you can also rely on your neighbors. I know that when, uh, when the marshals were sitting out in front of your house, uh, uh, guarding your house, uh, I understand that some of your neighbors were coming over to the car and knocking on the window and saying, who are you and what are you doing here? Since they and they were out there, they wanted to know what was going on. In fact, one of the neighbors actually called the West Des Moines Police Department and asked them to come by and check on some suspicious uh, uh, cars in the neighborhood. So they uh, it did create an uproar. I think uh, I wasn't the most popular neighbor in the neighborhood about that time. The, uh, the politicaz politicization of, uh, of the court process uh, and uh, criticism by politicians of sitting judges uh, is something that's cyclical over history. It happens from time to time. We're in a period of time where that's uh, going on a great deal now. Do you sense um, a long-term problem in conjunction with that? I do. I do. I, I, I think we as federal judges are very fortunate because, of course, we have lifetime appointments. and we're, were insulated to some extent uh, from the political process. But it, it certainly seems like the, uh, the judges uh, seem to be a, p a popular whipping boy or whipping girl for the politicians who uh, like to uh, point out some of the ramifications of our decisions and they, uh, the uh, favorite term is uh, we have to get away from these activist judges uh, that we hear a lot during the campaigns. I think uh, I've heard it defined that uh, an activist judge is anyone who enters a decision that you happen to disagree with. But I, you know, I, I think it's important that the the institution of the courts and uh, and judges be uh, respected in our society and that people think that when they come to a courthouse they're going to be treated fairly and impartially and that the judge or jury who hears their case will give them that type of consideration and render a fair and impartial decision. And I think the politicalization of the uh, attacks uh, on the judiciary erodes that respect and uh, tears down the institution and I think the politicians who are doing it are terribly irresponsible. Uh, and I think we've seen this here even in Iowa uh, where there have been some very controversial decisions uh, particularly on same-sex marriages and the attacks and personal attacks on the judges who made that decision, uh, in my opinion, are just outrageous and irresponsible. And uh, uh, just, I, I think the uh, politicians too often are trying to make uh, make uh, hay with uh, an issue that uh, they uh, think is temporarily going to be advantageous to them and they're not considering the long-term damage that they're doing to the system. How would you like people to remember your service as a judge? I would hope that uh, when I do 
uh, why I am remembered for whatever respect. I guess I hope to be remembered as a uh, I'll give up on anybody remembering me as a brilliant judge. I never tried to be a brilliant scholar, so we'll put that one away. That was not my goal in life. Uh, if I've achieved anything, I guess I would like to uh, to be remembered as someone who gave fair, impartial decisions and. Uh, gave it the best I could and uh, gave it my all. That's about all I have to say, I guess. We're right back to uh, Judge Stevenson's, uh, no mm -hmm. one is good enough to be a judge, you just do the best yeah, you can. I, well, I get the bottom line is I hope they, they can say, well, he really did the best he could. And that was pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. The Bridge Builder by Will Allen Dromgoul. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fears for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again must pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you the bridge at the eventide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there followeth after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been naught to me, to that fair-haired youth, may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building the bridge for him. <laughs>